Hello and welcome to the first Ask the Cabinet brought to you by Peterborough City Council. My name is John, I'm from the comms team at the council and I'm here with the council leader Dennis Jones who's also leader of the Labour group. Uh, he's been leader of the council since May so relatively new to the post. Well first the first thing I was going to ask you actually was about whether you're enjoying being leader. I, I enjoy is a strange word. Um, um, when things are going well, it's enjoyable. And when you get asked to do things that are within your comfort zone, then it's enjoyable. When people point fingers at you and they make nasty comments about not me, but my role, then it's less enjoyable. Is it fulfilling? Yes, I believe it is, because one of the things we come into politics for is to make a difference. And what you hope is that in this role and as a councillor, you're going to make a difference. So I'd say the word perhaps is fulfilling, I hope, rather than enjoyable, because that's a, a movable feast. Fulfilling. And also, obviously, you now have two Labour MPs for the city. Which... Oh, it's, it's it, I mean, obviously, politically for me, you can understand a Labour administration in the city, two Labour MPs, which we could not have dreamed about not that long ago, uh, a Labour mayor for the combined authority and a Labour government, somebody else used the phrase, a golden thread that pulls right the way through to central government. And I would hope that that will stand us in good stead, not just this authority, but you can appreciate the country as a whole, I'd like to think. And just on that, how do you think um, the Labour government has started over the past I think the same way, interested, I draw parallels between the Labour government and the local council. We've had to make very tough decisions. We will have to make very tough decisions. Um, I'm not going to get into the minutiae, but I'm broadly supportive, although there are things that we, I'm sure we and they could and should have done differently. But Generally, I'd say seven, eight out of ten as a start. Okay, that's good. Seven or eight out of ten. Um, so this is the first podcast that you and I are doing together. Let's make this a regular thing. Yep. Uh, we did ask for members of the public from Peterborough to send us in some questions. And uh, I should just say it's ask a cabinet. So in the future, it may be ourselves, it may be another host, and it may be members of the cabinet as well who will be helping out with this. But this is the first one. Sure. And uh, let's crack on with the question. So we had two, one from Roger and one from David, that kind of run into each other a little bit. Uh, I'm going to read Roger's. If Peterborough City Council were to sell some of its buildings and land or use some of the funds that we hope will be allocated for future projects, such as Station Quarter, would this alleviate some of our social issues and prevent them from becoming worse in the future? Uh, David from Dogsthorpe says... Or asks, lots of councils across the country have gone bust and have said they can't deliver the services residents need. Will that happen in Peterborough? Quite a big okay. old bold question from David. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you to Roger and David for the questions. I mean, they're very now. The first thing is, is, is that as a council, we spend about £220 million a year. The services split between statutory, in other words, that which is um, dictated by the government, and there's discretionary spend that we can spend on what we like. So effectively, if you look at it from a household point of view, you've got to pay for your gas, your electric, your council tax, but whether you choose to save for holidays or clothes or how much you spend on food is very much down to you. And our budget is no different. In order to achieve that, we're having a, we, we want people to engage with us to give us an idea of how they wish to spend the money that they're paying to us in business and council tax because they are our largest sources of income. The events will take place from the 18th of September until the 27th of October. They'll be in person. They'll, people will be able to do it in writing. They'll be able to do it online. But we do need feedback. You remember last year we had the budget simulator. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take it out there into eight wards. 
and we're, I'm going to ask members of the administration to come along and speak. And in, even just if they don't speak, just to listen to people. So what I actually want to do is get a feel for, we think we know how we would like to spend it. But, and the other thing, John, is I always say we're on the supply, as a local council, all local councils are on the supply side. We supply the services to each of our residents. People, residents, including myself, who pay council tax, are on the demand side. So what do you demand from us? What would you like to see us spending our money on? And this is the point of the events. Coming back to the questions directly is we are looking to sell some of what we call, we have what we call a local asset review where we have people who actually um, need to look at the assets that we've got. And if we sell them, then they come to us as what we call capital receipts. And those receipts must be used for purchases. The other part that people the word they may have heard or know is revenue and we can't use those capital receipts for revenue in other words we can't do it to keep things going we can only use it once and we must spend it once on things that the, the city needs yeah i should just say that um that's part of the the, the thing you mentioned at the start the consultation that's the shaping our city consultation so if people want to find out more about that they can also look on facebook as well and, and the sort of uh, engagement we've only just set that up and already there's a lot of engagement going into that people are uh, responding to polls putting out their own comments and things so that seems to have, have, have gone really well uh, if you want to find out where the various events are that, that Dennis mentioned uh, on the Peterborough City Council website there is a list of the full ones times uh, dates and obviously the venues themselves, and we're going around the city with it, aren't we? So yes, it, yeah, and it's it's um, quite a, quite an interesting way of doing it, isn't it? And it's good to get out there and meet people Absolutely. because sometimes you get concerns face to face that you might not hear yeah. via online. Yeah, and I think the other side of the coin for me is is that I would like members of my group to attend. And the reason is, is for exactly as you've said, John, is that what they can do is listen to people. You can see what drives them, and you're looking in the whites of their eyes. We're not hiding in ivory towers. We're not sitting in the town hall. We have to get out there and speak to people, and this is an ideal way to do it. And we're hoping that the residents of Peterborough will help shape our city in a way that suits all of us. Okay, thank, thank you. I Just one thing, should we, should we say a bit more to David? Because he's you know asked about councils across the country going bust and about not being able to deliver some of the services residents need obviously some very prominent ones is there anything you'd like to say to reassure him about that yeah first of all thank you david from dogs up it's my ward so you know i'm going to answer this question it's an excellent question and for the simple reason is is that a couple of three years ago yes we were much closer to going bust the word you use than we are now mm. and let me put that in perspective Councils don't go bust. It just means that income doesn't match expenditure. What happens is, is that a Section 114 notice is served and commissioners come in and cut everything bar essential services. You remember I mentioned about discretionary and statutory mm -hmm. spend. Well, all the discretionary spend goes and we're just left with the statutory, which is where we were much closer to. We've had an improvement panel in. And my understanding is, <clears throat> excuse me, while we're finding it difficult at the moment, most councils are and we're nowhere near as close to going bust or serving a section 114 notice as we were before. But we still have many tough choices that we need to make to ensure that we stay well away from that notice or the phrase going bust. OK, thank you. Let's move on. Um, two questions that kind of run into each other again. So we had an email from Graham, uh, and his question is, why does the area around Potter's Way look like this? Obviously, it's a podcast, we can't show you, but it is photos of fly tipping and dumped rubbish. 
um, regarding that. Um, he has uh, complained a lot about that. What we have got is a. Uh, I went to our operations manager, Laura Kelsey, for neighbourhoods. Um, she said that from the rough sleepers team, there is some rough sleeping at this location, which outreach colleagues are aware of, and they're supporting the individual that's there. Um, the other issues that Graham has reported to various departments relates to litter from sexual activity, as opposed to fly tipping. The police are aware of it. Graham's reports and patrol where they where they can and when they can, and also our team does, does so as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, with, with, with regards to fly tipping, that is an ongoing issue in this city, every city, isn't it? Yep. Um, yep. And, and, and I always say that it's, it's, it's not the council's fault. It's not us fly tipping anywhere, is it? I mean, is that a simplistic way of, of looking at it? Or Yeah. No, I, I, I think there's two issues. One is we have to draw a distinction between what is criminal activity and, and the services that come under the council. When we talk about fly tipping, we've just launched an initiative. We've had a grant of £50,000. We're looking at covert cameras. We have... Uh, protection enforcement officers out there this is something that we're focusing on that comes within the council when we talk about sexual activity then first of all a is it criminal activity it's not very nice but this becomes a law and order matter not necessarily a council issue although we would obviously sort support the police and the enforcement authorities really to make all areas of the city habitable, safe, where people feel secure and able to walk. So we have to draw the distinction, but we are working with the police, with the Safer Peterborough Partnership and with our, in, uh, with our Safer Partnerships to make sure that everything in the city, not just Potter's Way, and we work a, an awful lot with Rough Sleepers. We have a Rough Sleeper team Um we will not leave anyone behind, John. The whole point in this administration, if people are truly homeless, we will find them a bed, rest assured. What we have to do is deal with people who are professional beggars. Yeah. And what I'd like to do is draw the attention is ask those people, do they have a caseworker? Because we have a fabulous team that gets out. I will be going out with them in November because we have an annual audit. We'll be going out at 10 o'clock at night until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I'll be out there and we will find out how many truly homeless people we have in the city and we will do everything in our power to support them. But beggars we have to deal with on a separate issue. Yeah, that's a different thing, isn't it? I mean, some of them literally travel into the city to, Absolutely. to do that, so I've heard. So it's, um, yeah, that, that's com a completely different scenario the, the, the other question we had actually and you, you mentioned it there um from rosemary i went into the city center last week for the first time in a while and was shocked by the number of people in the doorways why is this the case and what can be done to help these people now our housing needs operation manager sarah scase um gave us some background notes on this and it's, it's a lot of about what you what you said there you have to remember that rough sleepers often have multiple and complex needs um, and, and the council supporting this cohort to, to leave the streets, but it can take a long time. Um, we, as a council, work with various services across the city to help provide this support to rough sleepers. It includes Aspire, Outside Links, and the Garden House, along with uh, many more. And um, we'd encourage people, anyone who wants to support rough sleepers, to leave the streets, to donate money to Safer Off the Streets, which again you can find on social media and their website rather than giving money directly to, to, to the people on the street. Yes, and I'd just like to reiterate exactly that point, is, is that two things, please feel free to ask them. Do you have a caseworker? Because the likelihood is these people are known to our rough sleeper team. Also, to not to give money directly to people, because... I'm I'm understanding from that team some of them are earning between 150 and 200 pounds a week mm -hmm. and often they have accommodation. Yeah. So we have to draw a great distinction between the people begging is now a national problem. It's not just in Peterborough or to any major city and you'll see people begging. Mm. Yes, people have complex needs, but as you've rightly said we have a number of agencies that I am deeply 
in awe of yeah. for the work that they do in that community and please make sure that you know we we do look after the people mm. who are truly homeless not the people who choose to beg on the streets mm. so just be mindful of that and give money please to aspire and to safer off the streets rather than directly to the people concerned help us to help them yeah and and i mean i, I suppose what rosemary is also getting at there is that it, it's uh there's a safety issue as well that some or a perception of safety that some people might have coming into the city not just safety but also how the city looks when there are Absolutely. homeless people there and yeah. it's probably not the the, yeah. the, the, the sort of um, the way you want the city to look is no. while feeling sorry for the people involved. Uh, absolutely. We don't want to sweep people off the street. We want to make sure that we are aware of who truly needs the help of the city and those that are obviously um, doing... If, if you're busking, if people are busking, mm -hmm. that's fine. You give money to them or, or you don't. Yeah. If you want to feed somebody's dog because they've gotten the blanket, that's fine. But again, allow us to take care of that rather than giving money directly, please. Okay. Uh, now, we've been holding quite a few Family Hubs events recently. Uh, we asked for questions from members of the public there, and they were forthcoming with a few. So let's start with this one. Um, why do EHCPs take so long? And what are you doing to tackle the delay? I guess we need to start by telling people Absolutely. what the EHCP is. Absolutely. Okay. So, yep. Okay. Um, EHCP stands for Education and Healthcare Plan. This is done for an individual child who usually, another acronym that people use these days is SEND, which is Special Educational Needs and Disabilities. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is that um, this is an issue. I've just come off... Um, a podcast, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't a podcast, it was a webinar that deals with this. It's a national issue, it's not a Peterborough issue. An education, health and care plan sets out extra help a child's need to access education in addition to what's available through special educational needs support. So problem is getting an educational health care plan, an EHCP, it really can take a while. And there's a few reasons. First of all, uh, the access to professionals who can do these, like educational psychologists, health practitioners, and social care providers, all of them need to get a complete picture of the child's needs. And frankly, that can take some time. Plus, gathering and coordinating all the details of the child's needs and information from different sources, it really can take some time, John. So what we need to do is get a real sense of what the child needs. This is key. My aim is for Peterborough to be a child-friendly city, and we must take the needs of all children of every education ability into account. And it's vitally important to ensure, basically, the future success for the child and, by turn, the family. So to tackle the delays, we're taking a few steps what we're doing is we're encouraging families to visit our family hubs. Those of you old enough to remember the Shore Start centres of the last Labour government will probably be more familiar. And we can, or they can help parents and carers equip themselves. And basically, there's some tools and skills to build meaningful connections, A, with their children, and these include parenting courses, sensory classes, and opportunities to meet and build connections with families dealing with similar situations. So what we want to do is create networks of people who can share live shared experience. We work closer with Family Voice, and this is a Family Voice is a, a parent carer group and charity who champion the needs of families, carers and children who all have special educational needs. A few other things that we, the council are doing as well, aren't there, in terms of the number of assessment team as well absolutely what we're doing is we're increasing the number of people on the assessment teams and we're giving staff more training essentially to speed things up we're also simplifying the administration process you know what bureaucracy can be like involving in issuing ehcps on top of that the council's also working on improving communications with families and schools. They're pivotal in making this work and making sure that everyone stays in the loop throughout the process and hopefully cuts down on unnecessary delays. Okay, thank you. 
Right, last two questions now. Um, and they're, they're both from a uh, family hubs event and they kind of run into each other again. Uh, the questions are, what are you doing to bring communities together in Peterborough? And what plans are there for more free family events in the city? So they are, there, there is a sort of overlap with those yeah. a little bit. Uh, and Ian Phillips, our acting head of communities, has helped with this, a very comprehensive list. And what we will do is, obviously we won't mention all of these uh, in this discussion, but when we do post it on social media, we will put a comprehensive list of what's, what we do Great. in the city. And I think yeah, that's a good, a good idea. So, um, you asking me as an, on a personal basis or a political basis? Uh, about this, yeah. I I, th I think as on a personal basis. Oh, let me let let me share. Let me let me share. I have a season ticket. Everybody knows. Everybody who knows me knows I have a pathological hatred of pay for parking, <laughs> but I have a season ticket at the um, Ferry Meadows, yep. Neen Valley, and the thing is down there. I take my dog for a walk quite frequently, and I love being there. I love it. And the reason being, I see gatherings of people. Mm. They sometimes put flags up. They have barbecues. And I love the diversity that you see at Ferry Meadows. And I love the diversity that those people bring to our city. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is and this is a shameless plug if you want me to come to one of your events the comprehensive events you're thinking of setting them up please invite me because i was also recently asked to speak completely impromptu at ferry meadows for um the african society mm -hmm. well i mean I've, I've i've spent a lot of time african community i've spent a lot of time in sub-saharan africa so, and a lot of the people there were from Nigeria, but from other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. And you can invite me whenever you like. <laughs> I absolutely love it. We have these events. We've had a Katia Yogateni was the first Russian counsellor. We have Lithuanian speaking people. I don't know if you know, but Dogsthorpe has twice the national average of... Um, Eastern Europeans and Baltic community and it has twice the national average of it whether you want to put that in is an entirely separate oh, matter no, I'm perfectly you know, but, and, and so I, I represent a very diverse ward mm -hmm. in a very diverse city and I'm in, in, incredibly proud of that fact uh, it's, and you mentioned um, Fair Meadows there um, Peterborough celebrates, which has become a giant festival now. You only need to look at the diversity that, that that goes on there over three days, all sorts of events from all members of our community, oh, multi faith, multi generational. It's, it's a really great event. Um, you've got every there at Three Meadows, and then every every Saturday park run. So you've got the the real yeah sort of mix of things that go absolutely. on. Absolutely, you know, I, and and I adore Ferry Meadows. And I do try and get to as many of the events as I possibly can. So if there's any that's not on my radar, I can't make them all. No. I do need a bit of downtime. <laughs> but, you know, equally, that is part of my relaxation, meeting people, talking to people, and really trying to walk a mile in their shoes, mm. because I think that's vital for a city like ours. We're still a growing city, and I think we just need to accept and understand and embrace the diversity of it. Is already here. I mean, just just off the back of that, some of the things that uh, Ian has mentioned. Uh, so we as a council support community events to hold events uh, to celebrate key cultural or religious celebrations, such as Diwali, Eid, Christmas, Black History Month, which is is, is coming up. Yep. Um, those sort of things, um, and we we do we work with 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 leaders of all faiths across the city to come together. We have a multi faith network. Um, We've got the event like that, and then we also have things such as um, supporting uh, the administration of the household support fund, for example, yes. in the city. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, uh, supporting events falling under the um, Alliance Project, which uh, people might know about. It's, it's helping to, to um, regenerate some areas and tackle organised crime in those areas as well. So we've got a real... Uh, a wide remit as a council, essentially, haven't we? Oh, to do huge. a lot in, in, in a, a city of 230,000 people or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. 
we we are um poverty has no limits and no boundaries as we've talked about fly tipping fly tipping doesn't have any limits or boundaries and the same thing now with our cultural diversity we're looking possibly to look at becoming the um, city of culture in 2033 and our, my dream would be is that all our communities of any ethnic origin comes together and showcases we have hyper local talent wouldn't it be great if as a result of that we had a cultural quarter in the city mm -hmm. somewhere that people could go and feel at home wherever you're from and that you could engage in the culture the nurturing the growth mm -hmm. and sit and peter becomes known for that and we embed that culture into the and the other thing i'd love to see is is that we become a cooperative city a city of cooperation so ma no matter where you're from you feel that people are in your corner are on your side and it doesn't matter where they came from because increasingly those people are coming from peterborough yeah. and that is that's i think is just such a buzz it gives me such a buzz and i i love that was, i love the diversity yeah i mean one other thing that ian has mentioned obviously um that the council successfully resettled refugees from afghanistan ukraine we work with charities including the red cross and help to integrate those into the uk Absolutely. as well um i guess i'll just uh, wrap up with one, one question you mentioned uh, a dream of having some a sort of cultural quarter etc in the city um do you think peterborough kind of punches its weight in those sort of things it, do, do you think people are uh, a little bit like pessimistic or jaded about those sort of ideas because they may have been mentioned before in previous years do you think we need to be more optimistic and positive about what we can do here the short answer to your question john is yes and the reason being is is we are we are a city by dint that we've got a cathedral but you've just mentioned we've got about two hundred and ten thousand people at the last census we're becoming a big city do i think we punch our weight no i don't we're 50 minutes from london we we are at the very edge of the manufacturing of the east midlands we sit on the edge of the bread basket of England, 50% of everything we grow comes from this region. And we just don't celebrate the cultural, economic and manufacturing diversity that we have here. And again, if there's one thing I'd like people to do is be proud of Peterborough. We, you know, we, we seem to have an identity crisis. I think as a unitary authority, and now we are a standalone unitary authority again. I want everybody to stand up and shout out for Peterborough. And that is, and that in that way, we'll start to punch our weight and start to look forward instead of over our shoulders at the past. The past is gone. Let's learn the lessons and move forward for the future.